Welcome trailer area to note video number 10. So this is the last note video in part 2 of unit 2. So unit 2 chemistry is split into three sections. Part 1 or section 1 was about the kinetic nature of matter uh, and how matter is always moving around and how we measure that movement and what happens to the states of matter when that movement speeds up and slows down. Uh, part two is about the periodic table in the elements. And then part three, which will come after this, has to do with chemical bonding and how those elements join together. So this is the last note video in part two, and we'll completely end up wrapping up uh, our knowledge about atoms and elements in the periodic table. So let's take a closer look at some of these uh, groups and families in the, in the table and see what they have in common. So group one, uh, group one goes by the name the alkali metals. Uh, that's the name for it. Um, there's three groups, or actually I should say there's four groups that you're gonna, that you should be aware of the names of and they are the first and second groups, so the first and second families or first and second columns of the periodic table and then the final two columns of the periodic table will also have names that you should be able to recognize. So the alkali metals come first. Um, they are, as I've mentioned repeatedly before, very reactive with water. Uh, I hinted at a video that I told you was an aura. Um, I just incorporated it into the note video, so we're going to take a minute, three minutes and 14 seconds actually, to watch that video. Um, it's from a British show called Brainiacs. Uh, they use some interesting language there, those Brits. Um, all of the elements in the alkali metal family are all very soft. Uh, in fact, some of them famously so. You can cut through some of these metals with something like your fingernail or a butter knife. Um, so they're not very hard, hard metals. They are never found naturally in pure forms. You're never going to find a stone of sodium laying around. Mostly because it's so reactive with water, and water exists in the, ap in the uh, atmosphere. So even like water vapor will react with some of these. Uh, the other ones would react with water vapor slowly. So hydrogen, I told you, is kind of like the, the one that doesn't quite fit in. Um, hydrogen is part of group one. Um, it's a loner, though, because it's not a metal. It's a gas. Um, it, it doesn't quite react the same way, but there's a really, really, really good reason that it, it is in the first family. Um, you just don't know what that information is yet, and you're going to learn that in part three of chemistry. So rarely, um, ever seen by itself on Earth, uh, hydrogen actually accounts for 90% of all of the atoms in the universe. Uh, so when we talked about what form of matter is most of the matter in the universe, and the answer was plasma, um, well, the, the continued answer to that, or the revised answer to that, is that it is plasma, but plasma of hydrogen. Um, so hydrogen is the by far, 90% by far, the most abundant of all of the matter that is found in the universe. All right, so um, let me uh, cue up this video and we'll check it out. If you have a minute, look at a periodic table and look at the order as we go down the periodic table in the first column. These next two are the dog's nuts of the periodic table. They are, if you like, the king and queen of alkaline metals. Mix these babies with water, stand well back. 
and watch the mayhem. And that's just what we're going to do. Mr. Tickle, bring on the rubidium. Here it is. Is that it? Well, it might not look like much, Richard, but it's a highly reactive metal. It's sealed in this glass tube under argon atmosphere conditions, just for safety. Right, so what's going to happen when you drop that in the water? Well, imagine, if you will, letting off a hand grenade in a bathtub. Right, Jack, I'm off. Have that. OK, good luck. <sighs> OK, Tickle, drop the rubidium in the water. Two grams of rubidium will only react when our specially designed vial dissolves in the water, which gives John a few crucial seconds to get into our safety zone. So two grams is two paper clips of metal. A depth charge is what boats drop in the water to destroy submarines. As our cesium sinks in the water, the rapid generation of hydrogen gas should produce quite an explosion. All right, so I guess I should revise, uh, see if any of you picked up on what the actual uh, characteristic that the first family has in common. Um, it's not necessarily that they explode in water, even though that's physically what was happening, but uh, I don't know if you noticed from what they were talking about with the, with the reactions, when you mix any of these with water, it gives off hydrogen gas. Now, some of them react more quickly with water than others do as you move down the down the, the family the reaction occurs more more with with more vigor uh, and at a much higher rate so you create hydrogen gas much more rapidly um, and this reaction is also exothermic so it, it's creating great a great deal of heat and hydrogen gas and remember from the flame test what happens when uh, you add heat to pure hydrogen gas you get that popping explosion well, if you have enough hydrogen gas, you get a pretty big popping explosion. So group two, or family two, uh, the second column in the periodic table, if you're going from the left and moving right, uh, these are called the alkali earth metals. So the first group was called the alkali metals. These ones are called the alkali earth metals. Um, I'm not going to get into why they're called these things. It, it has to do with, chemi with, uh, with the history of chemistry and how they first started isolating some of these, these elements. Um, but I'm not going to get into it because it's, it's honestly, it's kind of dry history. You don't know quite enough about some other things for it to really make sense anyway. So what you should know about, <clears throat> what you should know about the second family, they're, they're good conductors. Um, they're, they're all fairly hard while the first family was very soft. Um, the second family is pretty hard and that the metals are kind of white in color. They're not shiny in color like uh, you would expect metals to be. Um, one classic one, uh, things like calcium, is in the, the second family. You think of that as being what your bones are made out of and being kind of white in color. Uh, you never find group two elements naturally in pure forms. You'll never find like a rock of pure calcium again. Uh, and it's again because it's, it's reactive. It, it, it would react with just things that are in the environment around it. Then the big chunk in the middle of the periodic table. 
so that, that whole like lower section that's in the middle, these are all lumped together in a group that is known as the transition metals. We are going to do very, very little chemistry with these ones. Um, so this kind of whole chunk of the periodic table, we're going to leave out of our study in eighth grade. You're going to learn a lot about these elements when you get to the high school. Um, but this is like a, a pretty clear line with, with where we're going to stop in eighth grade and where I'm going to you know, let you pick up in the high school. Um, again, we'll kind of revisit this a little bit when we get to part three and we talk about how the elements are actually bonding together because um, that's the missing piece for you to really have an understanding of the periodic table and why it's laid out the way that it is. Um, but it's also why we're going to leave these ones out. But in general, uh, the elements that are found in this region are all good conductors. They're all hard. They're all shiny. Um, they, they don't react as much as, as the elements that are on, on the, the two ends. Um, but some interesting things can be done with these elements. They're very versatile. I mean, there's a lot of them in this category, so obviously there's a lot of different things that can be done. Um, but a lot of your paints and brightly colored um, things in nature get their colors from the elements that are in this zone of columns 3 through columns 12. Uh, this is actually pretty neat. I found... I guess recipes would be uh, a, a decent word to use for it, but like experiments, like a, a series of chemical reactions, which is essentially what baking and cooking is, just a series of chemical reactions. But these are recipes for making these two paints, um, and they are paints that have been used and made by artists for as long as there's been painting, essentially. Um, so if you think of like the old painters, like even like Da Vinci and, and, you know, Van Gogh and or even before Van Gogh, it's so like all the way back to like Da Vinci and Michelangelo, for example, um, when they were painting, you couldn't go to the store and buy a tube of paint. Um, you had to make your paint. Um, so these are two paints that you can make through a series of chemical reactions with, through a very similar process that those old artists would make. And I, and I have them and I... I think I ordered the materials to actually do the chemical reactions. I have to go check in the supply closet. But um, if I did, I think it'd be, it'd be a pretty neat experience for Sarah, for like a group of people to buy with, uh, with some gold. You could buy the experience of actually making your own paint, and maybe we can bring a canvas in or something, and you can paint a picture um, using green and yellow in some way, or using paint that you actually made through chemistry. I think that's, that's pretty cool. Pretty sure it's in. If I have the materials for it, it is in the market. So uh, 13 through 17 are the next couple of columns in the periodic table. Uh, these are mixed. They, they, this is where that like metalloid diagonal step line comes down through. Um, so they have a lot of varying properties because the ones at the top are non-metals, the ones at the bottom are metals, and the ones in the middle are the metalloids. So they're all kind of mixed up. The two at the bottom, the two periods at the bottom of the, of the, of the periodic table, the upper row that we call the lanthanides, um, they are all soft, they're very malleable, you can shape these metals very, very easily. They're all really highly conductive. We use them a lot in manufacturing when we're making things like alloys, which is what you get if you combine metals together to make them better than they are normally. Um, you're not going to recognize probably any of these elements in this lanthanide series except for one. There's one element in this, this row, in this period, that might uh, ring a bell, and it is this one. Number 60, capital N, lowercase d. It's uh, neo neodymium. Well, I can never say that word right, but anyway. Um, have you ever played with or had something that had a, a tiny round magnet that was like super ridiculously powerful magnet? Um, seems more, much, much, much more powerful than it should be for its size. That magnet is made out of this element. So if you ever see a tiny, sometimes they call them like rare earth magnets. Uh, so rare earth magnets uh, have a, a majority of the metal that's in a rare earth magnet is made from this element. Uh, the actinide series is the lower of the two at the bottom of the table. I'm not going to spend any time talking about them because really only four of them are natural. Only these four right here 
are the, so these are the highest largest most massive natural occurring elements and the rest of these are all man-made um, have only ever existed on our planet in very 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 tiny amounts and they don't especially when you get to the really high ones and the ones the new ones in the periodic table exist for like a billionth of a second before they destroy themselves because they kind of exist outside the laws of nature uh, for what can structurally be held together in an atom the, the forces inside the atom just completely tear themselves apart when you try to make these really, really, really big ones. Uh, some of these that um, are kind of interesting, though, uh, thorium, named after, yep, you got it, uh, Thor. Uh, uranium is uh, the, hot, the biggest one. Neptunium hardly ever gets any credit. You never hear of Neptunium being used for anything, but uh, it's the first synthetic one. Plutonium, americium we've talked about. Curium we talked about was the first one that was made with the uh, um, particle accelerator. It's named after Mary Curie, who we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Berkelium uh, is named after the city of Berkeley, California, uh, where the University of Berkeley is, and it's where this one was actually made. Californium is another one named after California, so two of them are named after California. And then we started naming them after famous scientists, uh, after Curie. Um, so we have Einsteinium, who needs no introduction. Fermium, who um, did a lot of really important stuff in science. Uh, and then we get to Mendeleium, um, and this is, I guess, the guy who figured out the periodic table should really have an element named after him. That, that's, that's very appropriate. Nobelium from the Nobel Prize. Um, so th they start naming them after scientists uh, for the bottom of this row, anyway. So I call the carbon family, it's one of these mixed groups in the middle. Uh, the carbon family is the one that has carbon on top. So they all kind of react the same way that carbon would. One of the things you should know about carbon is that carbon reacts with four electrons. Now, don't spend time memorizing this because this is, this is an important thing to know, but you're going to understand why it reacts with four carbons once we do part three. So it's not something you necessarily need to memorize um, for long-term memory purposes, but if you want to put in the back of your mind on the back burner that carbon uses four electrons, when we learn why carbon uses four electrons, you'll have that like aha moment. Uh, carbons that make up compounds that are made up from carbon make up uh, life. It's the, the, the life chemistry that we talked about before. And typically carbon atoms exist in really long chains of atoms. We call these hydrocarbons because they're long chains of carbon and hydrogen. Carbon in its pure form holds really interesting different like physical properties. This is an uncut diamond. So this is what a diamond would look like if you actually pulled it out of a mountain. Uh, and this is pure carbon. It is 100% carbon atoms. They're just arranged in a very particular crystal structure, and that's what we call a diamond. This is also pure carbon. Uh, I believe this is a big chunk of coal, which we mine around here and we end up burning for fuel. Uh, the graphite that is in your, your lead pencils is not lead, it's, it's pure carbon. So carbon has lots of different um, physical structures that it can, it can hold on to. The nitrogen, and then all of the other ones in that, in that family are, are similar. They all, they all react with four electrons. So carbon and all the ones in the fourth column react with four electrons. Nitrogen, which is the next column over, reacts with three electrons. Huh, this column reacts with four electrons, this column reacts with three electrons. If you have nitrogen gas, now if you remember from the reaction action lab, um, oxygen gas is not an oxygen atom, remember. Um, oxygen gas is O2. Hydrogen gas is not a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen gas is H2. Well, nitrogen gas, which is the most common gas in our atmosphere, is N2. And I use this, this, this word here with a few of the groups whenever I was talking to you about this, but these are called diatomic molecules. The prefix di means two. So these are molecules made of two of the same atoms, N2, O2, H2. Um, the thing about nitrogen gas that's really interesting is it is totally inert, which means it does not react with anything. So since 80% of every breath that you take is all nitrogen gas, when you breathe it in and you 
breathe it back out, it just goes back out. It doesn't react with anything in your body. There's no chemical reactions that take place with nitrogen gas um, in, in you. And in fact, there's very, very, very few chemical reactions on the planet that, that occur with nitrogen gas. Um, just a handful, and there's only one form of life that actually does anything with nitrogen gas as far as its metabolism and, and its interaction with the environment. Um, it's a really important interaction that happens with the roots of plants and things like that in the soil. It's a really ancient form of life, but that's, that's it. Nitrogen gas doesn't really do anything with much of anything. Now, nitrogen the atom, remember this is not nitrogen gas, but nitrogen the atom is one of the most important uh, elements in fertilizer. And it's also a really important element in the structural component of our own DNA. Uh, so nitrogen itself is really, really, really important on Earth. Uh, living things definitely do need it, especially plants, uh, and all of the DNA has it. So, so carbon is the, makes the backbone of all of our structural components. And nitrogen is really important in things like DNA. Um, phosphorus, which is the next one down in the nitrogen family, is used in match heads. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, causes matches to spark and ignite whenever you scratch them. Uh, then we have arsenic and antimony and bismuth. The, these are all the things that are in the nitrogen family. Bismuth is one of the prettiest um, elements. Uh, there's some pieces of bismuth on one of the masks hanging on the wall that someone made. It's got like rainbow colors to it. The oxygen family is the next family. Now remember, carbon reacted with four electrons. Nitrogen reacted with three electrons, nitrogen and all of the things in its family. Oxygen and all of the elements in its family react with two electrons. See the pattern here? Uh, oxygen gas is another diatomic molecule, it's O2, and it makes up about 20% of the atmosphere. So if nitrogen makes up approximately 80%, it's really 78, and oxygen gas makes up approximately 20, it's really a little bit less than that. Um, that's the majority of the gases in our atmosphere. The other gases are things like the greenhouse gases that are up there, carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane. Um, there's lots of other gases in the air too, uh, but they just exist in really small amounts compared to the nitrogen and the oxygen gases there. Ozone is a term that you should be familiar with because of the ozone layer. Uh, there's an atmosphere, a layer of our atmosphere called the ozone layer. It's really high up. It's beyond the troposphere. Um, well, at least it's at the, yeah, it's beyond, it's beyond the, the troposphere, definitely. Uh, the troposphere is the, the region of the atmosphere that we live in and that we breathe in and that weather exists in. And then once you get above the clouds and you get above the troposphere, um, you start to get into different spheres of, of the atmosphere, like the ionosphere and uh, the mesosphere and things like that that you probably learned about when you were in elementary school. One of those layers is the ozone layer. And it's really important. Um, it is O3. So ozone down in the troposphere is poisonous. You can't breathe ozone in and expect to survive. It's really not good for you. But its layer up in the atmosphere, really high up, uh, absorbs ultraviolet light radiation before that radiation reaches the surface of the Earth. Uh, as we learned about, ultraviolet light is a really dangerous source of electromagnetic radiation. It's got really high energy beams. Uh, it can scramble the DNA in your cells, cause mutations, lead to things like cancer. Uh, so this is a really important layer of the atmosphere for protecting life on Earth. Um, there's a big hole in it that is, uh, for the first time in like 20 years, I think two years ago, got smaller. Um, when I was a kid, the hole in the ozone layer, there wasn't a hole in the ozone layer, and then it started to appear, and it was really scaring everybody. We um, changed the way we make some products, uh, especially things that spray out of cans because there were chemicals in it that would devour the ozone layer after you sprayed the cans for like the next 20 years. They stopped making those. Um, then now the ozone layer is naturally regenerating. So ozone gets made when lightning strikes. So when lightning strikes through the atmosphere, um, it, it creates ozone uh, from the oxygen gases. It kind of combines them get together to make O3 from O2. Anyway, I'm on a tangent. Um, sulfur is uh, also in. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Sulfur is also uh, in this family, so sulfur also reacts with two electrons. You should be familiar with sulfur because it's what 
gives rotten eggs their terrible smell. When you smell rotten stuff like that, it's sulfur. It's very unmistakable smell. You can always tell when sulfur is around. Um, and sulfur is really important for you using rubber. Uh, I don't know if you realize, but rubber in your tires, rubber was considered to be completely useless uh, when it was discovered, and for a really long time it was considered useless because it was too soft. You couldn't make anything out of it. And then along came a guy by the name of Goodyear who figured out how to vulcanize rubber, uh, which, is, which he did by combining it with sulfur, and then it made rubber tough, and we could make things like tires out of it. Um, his research came at great cost to his family, but um, that's, that's, I don't know, that's how he did it. I'm, I'm glad we have vulcanized rubber, but I'm not so happy with the way that it, that it was discovered. The next family in the periodic table are the, uh, the halogens. So I told you that the first two have names that you should remember. There's the alkali metals on the far left, then the alkali earth metals. Well, now we are in the second to last column. Um, I refer to it as the seventh column because of the seven up here. You can also refer to it as the 17th column. But since we kind of ignore all of those ones in the middle, I count one, two for the two top ones. We skip all the ones in the middle, and then we go three, four, five, six, seven. So the seventh column uh, is called the halogens. And halogen means salt forming. So you can make salt with, uh, with any of these. We usually associate the salts, especially all the ones that you are familiar with, with this particular element right here is chlorine. In our reaction action lab, we were dealing with both sodium chloride and calcium chloride, so we were dealing with two different salts from that. Um, these are really, really reactive elements. These elements will react with lots and lots of other elements in lots and lots of ways. Um, if, if they aren't reacted with something else, if they are pure, they're really dangerous. Um, so, like, pure chlorine is nasty stuff. If you breathe in pure chlorine, it will, like, just destroy your lung tissue. Back in, war in World War I, when the soldiers were in the trenches, um, it's tough fighting. World War I was a, was a really tough war. You would, you would get into a battlefield, and then you would dig these trenches. You would dig these holes, and then you would hide in the hole. And the enemy would do the same thing. So on the other side of the battlefield, which maybe wasn't even very far, uh, you could like quickly jog across it or throw things across it, they would have holes dug that they would be hiding in. And you wouldn't come out. If you stuck your head out, you got shot at. So you'd stay in the hole. And every now and then you would try to make a charge across, and then you would just get shot at while you were trying to get across that, that little bit of land that was called no man's land. And then you'd retreat to your hole, whoever was left. Um, it became more of a war of attrition than it did like out and out battles. You would have to just kind of outweight your opponents and try to keep it so they couldn't get food and water and resources and you would just kind of try to outlast them. Well, it became so nasty that they started to come up with different kinds of weapons because bullets weren't working because you were hiding underground. So one of the things that was made was called mustard gas. And mustard gas was a, a gas, it was like a gas grenade kind of thing, and a main ingredient in it was chlorine gas. So notice it destroys your lungs. They made it so it was heavier than air, so it was more dense than air. So when you would kind of throw this mustard gas grenade bomb thing, the fumes that were chlorine would stay along the ground and they would go and they would fill up the trenches. So if you breathe this in, it would literally sear your lungs. Um, really, really awful, awful thing. And you would, essentially, it would force you out of the, of the trench and then, you would, and then the enemy would shoot you. Um, so gas masks were really, really important. Um, it was so bad and awful and people, it, like, it was just not, not a good thing. I mean, war is bad. But war with, this is, this is called chemical warfare, war with chemical weapons is completely unimaginable atrocious. Um, and actually after World War I, they passed international laws about how about this was just, humans should never do this to each other. Um, it was that bad. Which is why there's the stuff with Syria and all of that stuff that was going on um, and is going on uh, was 
really big in the news because there was chemical weapons being used. So that's chlorine gas. It's also here. It will ignite steel on, compact, on contact. So if you have like steel metal and you expose it to pure chlorine gas, it actually like catches on fire. That's insane. Uh, bromine is a liquid that would just burn your skin off if you uh, if you poured it on you, and not like an acid burn, but like a like a like a, a burn, like it's just a yeah, it's nastiness. Um, fluorine, as we talked about before, is uh, the most reactive element in the entire universe. It'll react with everything. Um, so this is uh, the king up here as far as reactivity goes. This is a vial of pure chlorine gas. So you can see how chlorine is like a yellow color. Um, it's pretty famous for being that yellow color, and that's where the mustard gas name got its name. Now, it's going to make, all right, so the, the picture's going to come up. I'm going to talk about two separate things on the next slide. I didn't want that picture to come up right away. But just because these things are really dangerous by themselves in pure forms, because remember, most non-metals are, are poisons in, in their pure forms. You, that doesn't mean that they're always dangerous all the time. So they're dangerous when they're pure, but the really cool thing about chemistry is that even though um, like sodium is a metal that explodes in water and chlorine is a gas that will kill you, um, when you combine those things together to make a molecule, because remember, we're just talking about elements. We're talking about the, the, the pure substances that make up the universe. When you combine those things together, you make a material that is completely brand new, a material that has characteristics that possibly never existed before, characteristics that are completely different from the things that make it up. Um, it, it's, it's a really fascinating part of chemistry. So while all of the materials in the entire universe are made up of these 92 pure, raw substances, when you start joining them together, you have an unlimited, infinite number of possible materials and, and possible um, characteristics that you can make from it. And, and since you can make these molecules really large and big and complicated, there is really an endless number of substances that can be formed. And that is, at its essence, what a chemist does. Uh, a chemist takes these raw materials and tries to build something from them that is useful to humans and, you know, and, and make money in industry, um, but by creating things that have properties that, that, are, that are, have a function that nobody's ever made before. And then that's where patents come in and, and it just goes from there. So some of the things that have been made by or using this, this halogen family, so these things that are so dangerous and nasty, are stuff that you use all the time, like Teflon. Um, Teflon is a combination of fluorine and carbon. Uh, so all of your pots and pans at home are coated in Teflon. If it was really that, if fluorine itself was dangerous everywhere, then we wouldn't be cooking on it all the time. It's got really unique properties. Nothing sticks to it. It's pretty awesome when you're trying to clean your pots and pans. You guys have probably never tried to clean a pot or a pan that wasn't coated in Teflon. It is awful. It is no fun at all. Um, fluoride is another compound that uses fluorine. That's, it's sodium and fluorine. It's a salt, just like sodium and chlorine is a salt. Um, and it is something that helps your enamel of your teeth stay strong. So there was a really, when they started... There was a really bad kind of epidemic across the country where teeth were just like our dental, our dental health was awful as a country. And um, the, the dental association really advocated with the government to, because people weren't getting enough fluoride. And um, the dental association was like, you know, one way that we could prevent this, um, because they've found connections between your, your, your dental health and lots of other health issues that um, if you can treat the dental health and you keep the, the the dental health uh, healthy, then you don't have other like issues like organ failure and like heart disease. It's weird the connections that they found. But anyway, so the the dental association um, advocated for fluoride to be put in water, 
So your tap water that you would get would have a little bit of fluoride in it, and it would be enough that it would help uh, keep your, your, your teeth healthy and, and no cavities and whatnot. In different communities would vote, um, because it's a very local law kind of thing about what goes in your water, about whether or not they should put fluoride in. And there were these huge campaigns like this one um, from people that were scared to put fluoride in their water because of things like fluorine is really dangerous and you know sodium by itself is really dangerous. So there, there's times when people know just enough chemistry and just enough science to kind of misinform themselves. Uh, and, and there's, there's places that don't have fluoride in their water. And one of those places that doesn't have fluoride in the water is Shaler. Um, and the reason Shaler doesn't have fluoride in their water is not necessarily from misinformation, but from a cost standpoint as well, because to have fluoride in the water, you have to pay for that because you're adding things to the water that wouldn't normally be there. Um, so there's, there's lots of reasons to not have fluoride in the water, but there are big parts of, of the country who think, who still think that this is like a government conspiracy of putting um, like fluoride in the water. There's a whole movie kind of based around it. Uh, it's called Dr. Strangelove. It's actually it's one of my favorites. It's a Stanley Kubrick movie. And then as you've um, you know, seen before, uh, sodium chloride is salt. We've seen that a lot. This reminds me of one of my favorite. Uh, it was on one of your old quizzes where people know just enough science to, to make themselves dangerous and misinformed. Remember the, the sign on the old quiz that said, um, warning, like no swimming water has been found to contain lots of dihydrogen oxide. Remember, di means two. So if you have dihydrogen, you have H2. And if you have oxide, you have an O. So people were panicking because their pond and lake and water supply contain lots of dihydrogen oxide. So... They were worried that their water contained too much water. The very last family in the periodic table uh, are called the noble gases. So this is the, the, last and, uh, the, la the fourth and last family that you have to know the name of. So you have the alkali metals at the far left, the alkali earth metals in second, the halogen family in seventh, and in the eighth column, the final column on the right side of the periodic table, you have the noble gases. These are the ones that don't react. So that's what they have in common. And in, the, in part three, you're going to learn why they don't react. So they all exist in our atmosphere, but they're really hard to find. Because how we tend to discover things is by watching for chemical reactions with them. And then if you can get something to bond with it, then you've kind of trapped the molecule. And then you can take that away and back to a lab or whatever and then try to untrap it and set it free and collect it. Um, a little bit like how you did with the single reaction, the single replacement reaction with the nail and the copper. Like you can put that nail in the copper solution and then literally collect pure copper on it and then you can take that copper back to a lab like that, take that nail and pull the copper off it and you now have pure copper. Um, but since noble gases don't react with anything, you can't do that. They're, you almost have to filter them out like a colander um, or like a coffee filter kind of thing. But they're atoms, so how do you, or they're molecules. So, so how do you do that? I guess they're atoms. They're atoms. So how, how do you do that? They're so small. So it's really, really hard. In fact, you, you think this is kind of silly since helium is something that everyone has experienced and, and has, uh, has personal exposure to. But helium was actually discovered to exist in the sun before we ever found any, like, trace helium on Earth. It was always here. We just had no way to, like, actually gather it. Uh, and even today, you can't just, like, go outside and suck whatever helium there is out of the atmosphere and collect it. The helium that we use or that we have in, like, containers for balloons and stuff like that is a byproduct of a chemical reaction that takes place in, in, uh, in um, industry. And we collect it and sell it off. They're actually worried, um, I read an article not too long ago, that the amount of helium on Earth is actually disappearing. It's, it's diminishing. And there's no way um, to, to end up getting more once, once we do run out um, because it's kind of like a, from the a reaction that has to do with, like, fossil fuels and stuff. So, oh, that's kind of interesting. So, you know, the, the price of helium is going to go up. You could invest in helium. Um, so anyway, the, 
One of the interesting things about the noble gas family uh, is that since they don't react, they do fun things when you send electricity through them, like glow cool colors. Uh, so neon is most widely known for neon lights, like uh, signs outside of restaurants and bars and things like that. And each of the different ones glows a, uh, a different color. A lot of other elements end up glowing colors too when you send electricity through them, but we'll talk about that later. So what is radioactivity? Well, radioactivity occurs, as I uh, explained in an earlier note video, when the nucleus of an atom becomes unstable. When those protons in the nucleus of an atom uh, can't handle being where they are, close to each other, and um, some of the fundamental forces that hold an atom together start to fail um, and taken over by other forces in nature, and the atom, the nucleus of the atom starts to fall apart and decay. Um, that is in itself what radiation is, but we didn't know it existed until almost the 1900. And this guy by the name of Henri Becquerel um, totally accidentally discovered it. Some of the best discoveries in science were not things that were planned out and experiments that went really well. Um, most experiments don't go really well. Uh, most of the, the, the coolest scientific discoveries that we learn about are things that were discovered because the people that it was happening near were astute enough to realize that something interesting was happening. So when we talk about Aristotle like working really hard, I'm sorry, not Aristotle, when we talk about um, drawing a blank here, I'm sure I'll remember it later. I hate it when that happens. The guy who figured out water displacement, um, Archimedes. Uh, so when we talk about Archimedes uh, having that like eureka moment and figuring figuring it out and all excited, you typically don't hear scientists. That's not what like you want to hear scientists hear or say. You want scientists to say things like that's interesting. Um, he had a rock in his desk, um, left it in his desk, and. Also in his desk was a piece of film, like for photography. And he went home for the weekend, and when he came back, he discovered that his film was ruined. His film had been exposed to, to, to normally that would only happen if your film was exposed to light. Once your film was exposed to light, it wouldn't work anymore. That's how you, that's how you took pictures back then. Uh, and then he noticed that it was because of the rock. Um, so that rock by itself was giving off energy. Uh, it was It was for no reason, and he postulated that the material in the rock was actually reacting with itself, uh, and it was exothermic, so it was giving off energy, and the extra energy had actually developed the film. Now, one of the people that was working with him was Mary Curie, and she's the one who actually coined the term radioactivity. To, for this process. Um, and nowadays we say that radioactivity is the spontaneous emission of energy from an unstable nucleus. Uh, she and her husband both worked with uh, Henri Becquerel and she and Henri actually uh, share a Nobel Prize in physics for this discovery of radioactivity. Um, Marie Curie is uh, pretty much awesome. Um, she is, is pretty unbelievable one of the most important scientists in our time. So I'm not talking about like, like ancient, you know, things that happen, but in like modern science, she is really, really important. She's the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize. And you win a Nobel Prize when you discover something that is deemed to be like the most considerable um, addition to our science knowledge and understanding of the world for that year. So she was the first woman to discover something, and in this case it was radioactivity, um, that really made a mark on science and changed our understanding of nature. Then she went on to win another Nobel Prize. And 
she became, by doing this, not only the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, but the first person ever to win two Nobel Prizes. There has only ever been one other person to win two Nobel Prizes since her, um, and this other person actually didn't win a Nobel Prize for discovering something. He won a Nobel Prize, sorry, he did win a Nobel, Nobel Prize um, for, for doing something, but then the other one was a Nobel Peace Prize. So it was a prize for trying to, to prevent war and broker peace in a certain part of the certain part of the planet. She's the only one to win two Nobel Prizes in science, but even more impressively, she didn't win two Nobel Prizes in physics or two Nobel Prizes in chemistry. She won a Nobel Prize in physics and a Nobel Prize in chemistry. So not only did she make the best, most important advancement in the knowledge of physics one year, and then she came back and was like, I'm going to do this now in chemistry. She was, uh, she was brilliant. And very, very much not liked by the scientific community. Um, one, they did not like the fact that she was so good at what she did and that she was a woman. Um, this was definitely back in a time when women should not have been doing important things, and it was really um, viewed badly, especially by the men that she was doing things better than. Um, unfortunately, her husband ended up dying at a fairly young age. Like they had a they had a very young daughter, and her husband died, and died as a from a freak accident. He actually got run over by a horse and carriage, which sounds awful, and then. She did all of these discoveries while raising her daughter. Um, she actually eventually became a, a pretty um, well-respected uh, like college professor, lecturer person in Paris, but um, still not, not very well liked by some of her peers. She, um, they didn't like to give her credit for lots of things that, that she did. <laughs> actually, they didn't want to give her her second Nobel Prize. Um, they didn't want to give her the first Nobel Prize, for that matter. But the second Nobel Prize, they really didn't want to give it to her because her husband had died. And she then ended up dating one of her husband's students at the college who was kind of like also working in the labs. So she had gotten a boyfriend after her husband had died. And this was not something that a woman was supposed to do. I mean, if this, this was not all that long ago. But, I mean, I know people that teach at Shaler that were teaching when a woman was not allowed to be pregnant and be a teacher. Uh, if you were pregnant, then you were not allowed to be seen in school. Um, there were very, like, kind of cultural things that, that you didn't do. And, and as far as Mary Curie goes, dating someone after your husband had died was not something that a woman was supposed to do. Um, so when she discovered two elements, she discovered polonium and radium and ended up kind of being nominated for this, like, like discovered two elements. That, that's unbelievable, considering most of them are already discovered by now, and, and it was just awesome. But uh, they actually called her up and said, you know, we're going to, you you should supposed to win this, but you should decline it because you, you should do that because you don't need the, the we just don't, we just don't want you to, to win. So you should really turn this down, and that would be best for everyone. And she said, no way. She went, she accepted the award, and then she immediately gave all the money to, uh, to the government to help fight um, in the war. She said, I don't even want your money. I don't want your prize, but you're not giving it to anybody else. Can you not keep it from me? She actually offered to even melt down the gold in the medal uh, that, that you get in the award to give to them to, to help fight in the war. Um, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. And then even after that... She kind of went the extra mile. Um, they, they really were not treating her very nicely. So the France was, it was in the war. She figured out a way to help. She sat down. She's like, I'm really bothered by all of this. She didn't know anything about really anatomy or, or stuff like that. And um, she learned about anatomy. She learned about x-rays. She then built and developed a portable x-ray machine that you could uh, hook up to a car. And when the government said that we don't, and the, and the top health people in the country said, we don't want x-rays in like on like for like battlefield medicine, that's not useful, that's going to get in the way, it's going to bother, it's going to, it's just not good, we don't want that. She totally didn't, didn't listen to him. She built the whole thing herself. She drove to the front lines to a battlefield and saved a whole bunch of soldiers' lives with x-rays. They could find the bullets and take them out and things like that. 
Um, unfortunately, by doing all of she actually did that with her daughter. She took her, her teenage daughter with her, and they were, they were doing that on the, on the battlefront. Um, from doing all of that, it wasn't understood yet how dangerous x-rays were and radiation was, and she became totally irradiated and died at a, at a fairly young age from, X, from like, you know, probably lots of different kinds of cancer from all the extreme radiation. In fact, her notebooks and clothes and lab equipment um, can't even be studied because they are so highly radioactive. Uh, you need to have, like, special outfits and suits and things like that to even get close to her notebooks, which is just wild to think about. Um, it's also crazy to think about that some of this stuff, this discovery of, of radium, um, it's not like she was spending like copious amounts of time in her lab. She was raising her daughter. She did a lot of the discovery of radium in a shed in the backyard of the house. Um, this is just unbelievable. So what is radiation? Uh, and how is it that atoms fall apart? And this is the last part of the video. Um, and if you have a good grasp from earlier note videos on atoms and how you can change the protons, neutrons, and electrons and what impacts that have on the atom, this will make sense to you. If you never quite figured out how to do the ions and the isotope things from before, this is probably going to confuse you because you really need to have a strong, strong foundation about what happens when you change protons, neutrons, and electrons to get this. But um, here we go. There's three kinds of radiation. One is called alpha decay. Alpha decay occurs when the strong force in an atom fails. There's four fundamental forces of the universe. They are gravity, uh, electromagnetic force, and then there's two forces that are called strong and weak force. Strong force is the strongest of the four, and strong force exists in a nucleus. Strong force overpowers, excuse me, strong force overpowers electromagnetic force when protons get really close to each other. So when you're pushing a proton closer and closer and closer and closer, electromagnetic force, so the fact that they're both positives and they want to they fly away from each other, but when you get them to actually touch, strong force takes over. Strong force is the most powerful, but it has the smallest range. So they actually have to be touching in order for it to, to, to have control. So strong force is what holds an atom together. But when you build, when, strong, I'm sorry, strong force is what holds a nucleus together. When you have more protons than strong force can handle. So in other words, when you have so many protons in a nucleus that the size of the nucleus is bigger than the reach of strong force, then electromagnetic force starts to take over. The, the amount of positivity in the nucleus of the little particles starts to take over and you start to lose some particles. They start to fly out of the nucleus. And one of the kinds of particles that can escape and fly out of a, nu fly out of a nucleus is called an alpha particle. And an alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons, and it gets ejected out of the nucleus. So what's going to happen to an element if two protons leave the element? Well, your atomic number is going to go down by two. So in other words, you're going to change the element. So a radioactive element, when it decays, literally becomes a different element. It transmutates, which is what those alchemists were trying to do for so long. This is actually what Mary Curie won her Nobel Prize for in chemistry, um, because she discovered the very first experimental evidence of one element turning into another element, and it was when it was with the uh, with the uh, radium. Radium turns into radon, which is gets in your houses and it's not good for you. But anyway, so alpha decay decreases the atomic number by two and the atomic mass by four. So if I give you a problem where I give you an element and I said it goes through alpha decay, you should be able to tell me the new element that gets made and what the mass of that new element would be. Now alpha decay is not very dangerous. Um, these particles, while, while they're small, they're only you know four subatomic particles big, um, what is actually this a molecule of? two protons and two neutrons. If you look at the periodic table, this is actually a molecule of helium, which is essentially how we end up getting our helium anymore, is from radiation. Um, so the helium molecule that comes off of that 
uh, can be blocked by lots of things. Your, your t-shirt will block it, a sheet of paper will block it. Um, but if you are bare skinned, like if you if you reach out and grab something that's radioactive, that's giving off alpha particles with your bare hand, it will cause like damage to your skin and can burn you. Um, but as long as you have something over your skin, alpha decay is not dangerous at all. Beta decay, on the other hand, is more dangerous. And um, the reason it's more dangerous is because the particle is smaller that comes off. And the smaller the particle, the higher the speed that it can have, the more you know, damage that it can do when it, when it hits you. So beta decay occurs when weak force fails. Well, if strong force is what holds protons together in a nucleus, what does weak force do? You can think of weak force as what holds a neutron together. So we mentioned previously that you can, it's okay at your level to think of a neutron as a proton and an electron that are kind of joined together. Well, one of the reasons that it's okay for you to think that is because when weak force fails, a neutron breaks down and turns into a proton and an electron. So when the neutron breaks apart, it leaves behind a proton. So that means the atomic number of the element goes up by one. So when alpha decay occurs, when alpha radiation occurs, we get a new element that's two numbers lower in the, in the periodic table. When beta decay occurs, we get an element that's one number higher in the periodic table. But it doesn't change the mass because that neutron, which we figure has a mass of one essentially, turns into a proton, which also has a mass of one. What's actually being lost is this thing called a beta particle, and you can kind of think of that as an electron that's shooting out into the ethos. And when you get hit by that really high energy beta particle, um, it can do some damage. So, beta particles can be blocked by metals, which isn't surprising because if that beta particle has characteristics of an electron, Metals really suck up and dissipate electrons really well. They're really highly conductive. It can just send that beta particle all around and it takes away all of its force. Um, but it does take about five millimeters of aluminum to block a beta particle. If you were to get hit with a blast of beta particles, it would easily travel through your tissue and get into your DNA and could seriously cause mutations. But the most dangerous kind of radiation is not beta, beta decay, it is actually gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is dangerous because it's even more high energy. So while alpha decay and beta decay are actual particles, they're actual objects with mass that are flying through the air like little subatomic bullets, um, beta decay is pure energy. This is a form of electromagnetic radiation. So this is like x-rays, but super powerful, more dangerous kinds of things. Um, they're really high energy. To block beta, I'm sorry, to block gamma radiation so that you'd be safe, you would need a full meter of concrete and several centimeters of lead. So you would need to have a full meter of concrete wall that was lined with lead to block the radiation. They would pass straight through your body and, and potentially wipe out scramble the DNA that, that would be there. Um, this is the, uh, the, the kind of radiation that, that uh, the, the comic books say ended up creating the Hulk. So how is it that we end up using this radiation? Because radiation is not really all that bad. It can be very dangerous, just like anything else in science, but um, you know, if used properly, it can also be very good. So we use radiation, as I mentioned before, to uh, power nuclear power plants. It's that heat that's given off from that plutonium that boils the water that then turns these huge turbines. I told you it turned a fan. I just never told you how big the fans were. This is a whole building complex. Like, you, like, you can't even see the doors are so small. Like, this thing is a, is a few stories tall, this fan, that the steam ends up turning to create the electricity. Uh, we can use mildly radioactive elements in tracer things in medicine. So uh, we can kind of like inject you with a serum that has a little bit of radi radiation in it and then put you in a machine when the machine can track the radiation around. So this is one way that we find things like tumors 
So this spot here is like really lit up because the radioactive tracers that were injected in the bloodstream all collected there because they were supposed to target a certain kind of cell and they're like, there it is. Now you can go get it. Uh, we do use gamma radiation to um, figure out since it goes through really thick structures. We can find weak spots in metal in metals like like bridges and in, um, in the city and whatnot if there's like an earthquake or something like that we can use a machine that uses gamma radiation to figure out if any actual structural damage was done that you couldn't see with your eyes um, so radiation does have a lot of really good uses and that does take us to the end of video 10 I know this was a long one hopefully hopefully you learned something along the way uh, 16 questions good luck and this wraps up part 2 of the middle part of the chemistry unit. Have a nice day.